The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay. Good morning. Welcome. We're happy to have you here for our webinar this morning. I'm Angela Crum, and this is Moor Katz. We're both from the Feeling Good Institute, and we're excited to talk with you today about ethical, effective, and warm tips for doing video-based therapy. Uh, before we jump in today, I'm going to provide a little bit of information about the continuing ed education units as well as the technology. Um, so first of all, if you are licensed and listening to the broadcast live and would like to receive continuing education units, then you do need to be here until the end of the hour. So we will be taking attendance. And if you leave early, unfortunately, we cannot give you the one free CE credit. Um, if you do complete the broadcast live, then within a couple days after today, you'll receive an email from Feeling Good Institute, and that will have a survey, which is required before you can get your continuing education certificate. So look for the survey within a couple days, fill it out, and that will initiate you getting the completion certificate. Um, unfortunately, CE credit is not available to folks who watch the recorded broadcast after the fact. Um, next, I want to orient you just briefly to go to webinar in case this is your first time participating. Uh, to the right of your screen, hopefully you're seeing a control panel. And you'll notice that about halfway down the panel, there's something called the chat box. And this is an opportunity for you to engage and participate with us during the presentation. You can pose questions by typing into the chat box and choose whether it goes to the whole audience or just the presenters. Unfortunately, we won't have a lot of time for questions today because we do feel excited to get through the 10 tips with you, but we'll do our best to attend to ones we can. And you may also hear from our telehealth clinicians around the US and Canada who can help answer some of your questions via the chat box. Maybe someone can help us by putting a message in the text box. To know test that. it now? Yeah, yeah test great. It. So someone be, <laughs> be a helper and see if we can see a chat if you're willing to try a chat box and send it to us as a tester. Thank you. Um, we'll look for that in just a moment. Um, the last thing I wanted to tell you about is that you should also see halfway down your screen an orange P, and the P, clicking on it, will help you access the PowerPoint slides for today's presentation. So go ahead and open up that now if you'd like, um, and after the presentation, even if you're attending live, you will receive a recorded version of the webinar today. Um, so we're still not seeing anything in the chat box. Um, hmm. Yeah. Maybe everyone's feeling nervous to, to type. Or maybe no one is listening to <laughs> <Yeah>. us. <laughs> We're talking to no one. So we'll assume that, that it's, um, maybe we'll, we'll probably move forward anyway. We should move forward? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, oh, how to, oh, give us just a moment here as we kind of settle in. Okay, um, great. So just briefly wanted to share with you our clinicians who are spread out throughout Canada and the US who do teletherapy for Feeling Good Institute. Um, I won't have time to introduce all these folks by name, but on the second from the top left, you'll see a picture of Mike Christensen in Canada. He's our lovely clinician who um, leads our telehealth uh, clinicians and provides them consultation. Just a wonderful, warm guy who provides services throughout Canada. Um, you see a handful of other folks we have here in California, Florida, Kentucky, Ohio, Michigan, Oregon, New Mexico, Illinois, and New York. So we're excited to have all these folks. Many of them are, are participating live with us today as well. Um, great. And it looks like we are seeing um, some greetings here from folks um, who are with us today. Robin, John, Debbie, thank you to, to those and others who are, who are saying hello and greeting us today. It's great to see you all there. Um, lots of folks. Um, okay. Thank you, Angela. Um, so I wanted to say uh, just a few words of thank you for uh, creating this this uh, web presentation, this webinar with with us. The way that it came to be is with us asking 
um, the community of therapists, really what are some challenges in video therapy? What is um, what would be some concerns? And as you probably all know, we had a lot of a lot of responses, which which was really thrilling to see. We got hundreds of support emails and, and dozens and dozens of suggestions. And then we were kind of sifting through it uh, to help make this uh, webinar helpful for, for people. And uh, it's been a learning process for me, um, kind of distilling these, these questions into answers and ideas of how to, to make your experience better using video therapy. Um, so I wanted to, to thank all of you that, that answers and answered it in that. And um, as we were looking at the responses uh, we received, um, it became clear to us that there were uh, kind of clear um, issues that people had that wanted answers. One is connection. Can we create a warm uh, human connection uh, with, with our clients? Can, can there be a meaningful, uh, as meaningful a connection on, uh, online using technology and the, uh, the obvious kind of technical barrier uh, to, to the human connection? So this this one thing. And then the other is, how can we do this ethically and legally? How can we provide therapy to people very far from us uh, legally and ethically? And what are those concerns and how can we answer them best? And then maybe the third topic is, uh, how can we be effective doing this? Can this be effective? There's no question, and if you look at the literature, that it is as effective as, as um, therapy um, in person. That, that's been shown, but that's, uh, we wanted to go beyond it. How can we make this experience really effective for our patients? And um, this was kind of the third theme. So hence kind of our, our um, uh, topics for the webinar. And uh, all of our tips would be basically directed at these three themes of um, connection, warmth, uh, effect, uh, being effective, and also uh, the legal aspects and ethical aspects. And before we dive in, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about Feeling Good Institute, what we do. Um, we are um, an organization that's dedicated to uh, improve therapy, to make therapy better. To um, We want to have high standards of effectiveness and connection, um, and uh, we want to participate in anything that makes uh, therapy um, better and more effective. And uh, we all have been trained with um, the wonderful Dr. David Burns um, using uh, his approach to making therapy better, which is called, uh, he coined it as Team CBT. What we do at Feeling Good Institute is we train therapists. Um, we do training, we do uh, uh, treatment, but the training part is a lot of what we do. And um, we also uh, help therapists progress in their training through a certification program in Team CBT. Um, We've developed uh, systems and, and treatment centers, both in California and Mountain View, where we're coming to you right now, and Silicon Valley, as well as New York City. Um, and we've also created, um, not super long ago, the video therapy program with the intention of um, making effective therapy accessible to people from, from anywhere. Um, we're also developing some uh, electronic uh, tools to help uh, make therapy more effective. And um, yeah, maybe most recently we've been kind of trying to think of other ways as well, but mm -hmm. training hundreds and hundreds of therapists per year um, in, in these kind of measures. And specifically with video therapy, um, as I said, we want to make it accessible. And uh, our video therapy program um, has been developing uh, really nicely. We have really high standards. We want our therapists to be really awesome. <laughs> so um, we don't want to. We don't want it to be kind of uh, uh, ineffective therapy accessible to all. We want it to be <laughs> kind of kick-ass therapy accessible to all. And so we are. Um, we're uh, really cherry picking our therapists to the program, and only therapists who have reached a certain advanced skill level in um, in. Uh, Team CBT in our certification system, and also we kind of vet them um, with that we want people to be very highly uh, regarded by their teachers, and then we invite them to um, to participate in a video therapy uh, program in different states. And so this way, um, we've been able to develop this video therapy uh, program as a treatment center um, online in multiple states and. Uh, in California, in New York, and in, in, um, in Florida, and Michigan, 
and Illinois and Ohio and Kentucky and Oregon and uh, New Mexico. And um, it, from a kind of a um, teaching perspective, it's led by Mike Christensen over in Canada, who provides uh, treatment in Canada. So um, if you're interested in uh, learning more about that, please let, let me know. Um, if you feel like you'd be a good fit, we'd love to hear from you if you want to be uh, a provider for us as well. And we'd also want to, uh, some, of us, some, some of your questions will be answered today by uh, our video therapy team. So as we're diving into our content here, um, I want to ask you, do you use uh, video-based therapy? And I'm going to pull up this poll if I figure out how to do that real quick. Mm -hmm. So um, you're going to be able to answer this question uh, right now. This um, the poll has been launched, and we're going to give just a few seconds to answer this question. Do you? What's your experience really with video therapy? Uh, just to kind of understand our audience today, um, have you ever engaged in it, or really super rarely, or fairly regularly, or kind of all the time? And uh, we're going to give you just a few more seconds here to answer. It's really fun to watch the numbers come in. It's like a video game popping up with. <laughs> yeah, who's going to win? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So cool. So maybe. Like, looks like 80% have voted. Maybe that's, okay. that's as good oh, yeah, as we'll I see. get in terms of maybe not. What about the question. other 20%? <laughs> we'll hold out for those 20% who are busy drinking their coffee. Or figuring out where <laughs> to answer this. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to count to five and close okay. the poll. How about, how about that? So uh, I think I'm up to five. So I'm <laughs> going to close the poll. And I see yeah, about 88% answered. Great. So that's not bad. So uh, I'm going to share the results with you. And I think you can see the results on the screen. And you can see that really the majority, the vast majority of our audience mm -hmm. today really has either rarely or never have done video therapy. So I'm, I'm so kind of thrilled that we get to give you some, some pointers to make it feel easier and more accessible to you because I think there's no doubt that it's going to become more and more part of everyday practice um, in, in modern therapy. So, um, and I do see it too that there is like a, a 9% uh, that do it all the time, which is it's a small number, but um, hopefully we'll have some pointers to you too. And I want to encourage all who have experience to share their experience in the chat box. If you have some ideas of something that we say, kind of encourage, want, want you to feel encouraged to share in the chat mm -hmm. uh, things that um, ring true to you or you want to mm -hmm. add to from your experience to it as well, to our presentation. Up, Angela, I think you know how to do this. <laughs> Help you get on to me. Okay. Let's see. Next slide. Awesome. So I'm going to start with tip number one. And our tip number one, I think, as I was thinking about this webinar, I think it's really the most important thing that I've learned in my experience in, in video therapy. And I, I've done video therapy for, for a few years now. And, um, and it seems like it's becoming a larger and larger part of my practice. And I think the most important thing that I've learned is to really insist on having an awesome connection. And by that, I mean technologically. So I, uh, I also think the setting is gonna be very important to insist on. Um, insist that your clients meet with you from a private room with great Wi-Fi using a laptop or a desktop. Sometimes maybe like an iPad type thing is okay, iPhone, never okay. Outside, never okay. Not having privacy, never okay. And um, this involves some challenges because um, you'd think I'd learn how to change the slides by now. Thank you. So um, I'm repeating this here. Um, you want to insist, you're going to insist this because it's going to, uh, you're going to face some situations where it doesn't happen. You're going to kind of be shocked because once we kind of, the, the room, the physical place kind of evaporates, all sorts of other places can seem reasonable to some of our patients. And um, 
So um, here's just some examples of my experience um, of uh, kind of places where it um, was inappropriate to meet that I just kind of found myself, a, a patient kind of logging into our uh, therapy session. It was a subway station. Uh, there, by the way, there are no subways in California, so you also know that it's it's actually out of state. And then there was a bus station. There was the beach. Um, several times, college campus lawns. Um, seeing like people think, yeah, I'm in pri with privacy. They're having earbuds, and they're on. There's sidelines of the highway. I had a patient drive from San Francisco area down to LA, and pulled off, uh, pulled over on Highway Five, and she was late to our meeting and. Um, uh, wanted to meet that way. A dashboard of a car, just in the parking lot. Someone, you know, went left their uh, office space and went to their car um, at work and um, wanted to meet from their college dorm, from their room, just kind of wearing PJs, just just clearly just woken up. Um, and I had even someone meet with me from a closet where she felt like she would have some privacy from her uh, roommate. So. Um, with all of those situations, I had to overcome my anxiety and my fear of confrontation and saying to my patients, I'm so sorry, like, I, I, I really I'm gonna have to insist that we figure out a way that we find a way to meet, you know, with uh, a good Wi-Fi, a private room where you're comfortable and completely in privacy and using a really good connection and a good device so we can have that connection, so we have a chance of actually having this warm connection. So I wanna encourage all of you to overcome that anxiety that comes up whenever something like that happens. Um, so no matter how many times you'll tell your patients ahead of time that that's how they need to meet with you in person, or I'm sorry, um, from a room, you know, in private and all that, these situations will occur to you uh, and it's okay. It just means be prepared to be insisting and uh, being be ready to to reschedule. And 100% of my patients with all those situations understood that the reason that I'm kind of insisting on that is not because I'm being unreasonable. It's because I want to have a meaningful connection with them. And I want to have war, uh, a warm, meaningful connection with them that can be effective and conducive to good therapy. So um, that's my, my first tip. And um, I wanted to ask you guys too, to, uh, Put in the chat box um, any um, any situations that you had that, um, uh, or you can maybe sometimes it's easier to put in just in a question box in the form of a statement, um, situations that you had that um, you uh, encountered of uh, being in kind of weird places. And I see um, um, Raphael's putting the bedroom, um, and um, uh, car driving, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, right? So these are true to life and, uh, and they're, they, they seem so clearly absurd to us, but they happen to all of us all the time. And so uh, we want to say, uh, want to say to you be prepared, be prepared to just insist on uh, a, a setup for a therapy that can be conducive. Um, Angela, does any one of those other ones uh, I, I pop up to you? I see a question that looks like it got raised a couple of times, which is asking you more to elaborate on why is a car a problem? For example, folks are wondering, <clears throat> maybe they're thinking it could be private, it could be quiet if they're parked somewhere. Can you speak to that for these folks? Um, it's up to you. Um, if you feel comfortable with a car, you know, uh, that's okay. In my experience, cars are not really private. Um, cars have large windows. Um, also, what I I want my therapy, I want my patient to be able to write. I want to be doing some uh, some really kind of intense thought and emotional um, therapy uh, exercises with them. And being in a car um, doesn't allow you for that. I think yeah. ideally for me, for my kind of therapy. Uh, in my experience, to be effective, I, I also don't want it to be on a couch. I want their to, to, their hands to be completely free. I want there to not worry about anything happening around them, have le least distractions. I have a little bit of ADD. I'm sure a lot of my patients have that too. I can be easily distracted. So I want to kind of have the most, the best connection I possibly can. Um, and one that allows for, for us to actually dive dive in and do meaningful emotional work and i think a car to me doesn't uh doesn't cut it um 
but if you have different experience, um, you know, I don't know, maybe an RV, I, I'm not sure, uh, could, could work. But th that's, that's my recommendation to you for sure, um, to insist on that. Mm -hmm. Tip two. Um, so um, I want you to think about ways, and this is the tip, to create rapport in spite of the technology. So later in the webinar, I'll share with you things that you could do to get the use and aid of technology. But here is kind of in spite of technology. And um, uh, when we asked our video therapy clinicians what what would be some good ways to, what's some good tips from, that they've learned, then uh, Mike, that I mentioned to you from Canada, mentioned something that I think is a really good tip, um, which is to position your uh, uh, incoming video on your screen up near where the camera is. And so like I'm doing right now, your experience, your, I hope that you're experiencing mm -hmm. me is more engaged with you and more engaging because I am looking directly at the camera. Right. Versus this. Right. Or this. Yeah. Right? You often see a client where you just see like this right. much of their face. Right. Totally. So, um, so you can position their video feed, uh, just, you know, you just drag it, you, you click on it and drag it most, most, uh, uh, systems that their, uh, their face shows up right underneath your camera. Uh, sometimes automatically it shows up like on the far right or on the far left, and then you just need to, to drag it. And then they have the experience that you're looking straight at them. And that makes a big difference. So thank you. Thank you, Mike, for that. And then um, Julie also mentioned, uh, Julie Simmons, who, who uh, does the uh, video therapy uh, over in Florida, um, mentioned the, the, the point of always having your client's phone number, having your own phone right there, having your earbuds ready. So if something goes wrong with technology, you can kind of sort it out really quickly because it can be very frustrating and it can feel kind of hopeless and, and annoyed when, uh, and so with the patient, if something kind of goes wrong and oftentimes it's not rare that initially in the beginning, like things are a little, a little off and then you kind of establish connection. So have, be prepared that it's technology. Like we had some technology problem this morning. Like we couldn't figure out how come this, uh, go to webinar system is not working for us and we had backup. So we're actually talking to you from the backup as well. So um, uh, that's that's a that's a good idea. Uh, so my tip to, to finalize maybe tip number two is um, figure out, kind of think of ways to create rapport with your patients, kind of understanding what their experience is dependent on, uh, and so you can do some steps to uh, to help their their experience. Um, my uh, next step that I want to share with you is about you doing your part or us therapists doing our part um, in the connection. Um, and um, this has kind of multiple layers to it. Um, we want to create warmth, right? This, these, the series of tips that I'm mentioning to you are all about creating warmth and connection. And it's not only our patients that um, can do less than ideal things. Like I find my mind being distracted sometimes. What if I have notifications coming in and it catches my eye? Um, and um, what if some, sometimes I'm, I'm really kind of nervous about some, something that I'm expecting or uh, on my phone? So um, think about what is it that you need to do in order for you to be fully present, given that you will also be kind of seduced, kind of tempted with different um, aspects in your life while you're in front of this amazing machine, you know, the computer. And um, so um, one thing that I would uh, recommend to you is to avoid your own distractions. Um, make sure your connection is, is really good. You're turning your own notifications off uh, on, on your screen. Um, one thing mm -hmm. that I noticed is that if I show my hands uh, to some degree on, on, on the screen, on the view of the patient, then that's a guarantee that my hands won't be doing anything else. And so um, it also serves as a way because we also gesticulate and uh, that's another way to connect and to convert uh, to converse in nonverbal uh, ways. And also it's a way for me to not to make sure that I'm not um, I'm not letting myself be distracted by, by anything. Um, I also uh, would recommend to you to 
since you know there's something about the patient coming into our clinic into our home you know whatever uh homey clinic you know a warm and and brown colored clinic you know and um that's that 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 experience is meaningful and some of you had questions about that of for the patient to come into this space that is kind of a little sacred and and and, and is a space that is more emotionally present and kind of means slowing down and diving deep and, and getting getting some emotional connection and relief and um make that easy for them uh for your patients also um on the using technology have a nice backdrop that conveys warmth and connection and, and humility and and uh presence um and also i would recommend to say a little bit about yourself like of course in an appropriate way but where are you coming where is your office located where are you coming from uh to them today um say a tiny thing about your surroundings that would make it feel more human and um and and less kind of remote uh and and technical um a lot of us work in clinics and so my my program my my therapy um clinic is uh, because I do some video therapy and some in person, sometimes I could have a regular session and then I turn to my desktop or my even my laptop situated appropriately and do a video therapy session. So um, you might be sharing a connection. Sometimes I work from my home office, my home clinic, and then my kids might be on their own, you know, YouTube, et cetera, and kind of on their own devices. So make sure that your connection uh, isn't shared with other people have a dedicated connection to to your video therapy clinic because that could create a lot of choppiness and that's very frustrating and takes a lot out of the warmth and connection as well um, so and again if people want to share some of their ideas about how you know th there's some kind of tricks um, about how to to create warmth and connection um, and do kind of our part here i'd recommend that you do that so um, I think with that, I'll pass the baton a little yeah. bit to you, Angela. Sounds good. Yeah. Great. Um, great. So for tip number four, um, we're moving actually into kind of the, the second of three parts that we're focusing on. So we're talking about empathy, ethical parts, and effective therapy. So we're going to move now into the ethical region. And that, that word is used broadly here to cover a number of things that are related to picking clients, uh, laws, and legal pieces. Um, we're kind of using that broadly here. So my so tip number four is about screening who is the appropriate client for for video based therapy and of course who is not as appropriate and as we start this tip go ahead and add to the comment box if you are thinking already of rule outs that you have for uh, video based clients so if you're someone who already does this are there specific presenting concerns or things you're thinking about that might tell you someone's not an appropriate fit um, so the, the truth is there's not sort of a hard standard that I can give you that says these are exactly the folks you should see and the people you shouldn't see because, of course, this is going to uh, depend largely on your own clinical expertise, your own clinical decision making and comfort level with different types of clients. So instead, I'll pose some thought questions for you today to help you come up with these decisions. Um, initially, surely I want to encourage you to have a very specific screening process that allows you to learn about the patient before you first start like a video intake with them, right? You want to figure out what will be your method of talking with these folks in advance. So we like to actually do it over video. So we do a free 15 minute video based conversation as a way to gather a little bit of information about goodness of fit. And we also collect then, of course, pretty substantial intake information where the client fills out electronic forms that tell us quite a bit. So given those two pieces of information, we feel pretty good that we know enough to be able to decide if we think we can be helpful for this person in general and over video. Um, so some questions you might consider would be things like, would you feel comfortable working with someone who has active suicidality? Or is that something that you might need to see the person face to face to do a good job? 
a more thorough job with your assessment. Um, what about access to diagnoses? And I, I don't mean that you would consider ruling out all of them, but simply being thoughtful about what what struggles that exist for, for our potential clients may get in the way of their ability to be open or honest over video. Um, you know, if you don't get to read the, the scene and the demeanor and all of the um, nonverbals as easily, um, you know, if there were cognitive barriers, what, what about working with younger folks and, and um, your ability to kind of get, get parents involved or have consent from parents? Those would be parts you need to work through, right? Surely people do video therapy with, with youth with thought, right, and, and planning. Um, so there's different things you might you might consider. Um, one thing, you know, other other thoughts that I have about this are folks where you really do need to lay your eyes on the person. So, for example, if someone has been engaging in cutting and you need to see the cuts in order to be able to, you know, diagnose severity, how would you handle that over video, right? So these are parts that you want to think through in your practice that can lead you to decide where is your comfort level. And of course, with higher risk clients, we'll talk later about safety planning and how you have a local support team. And so if you are going to work with higher risk clients over video, you'll want to be even more thoughtful about what the safety plan would look like to make it um, to make it really effective and to give your best care to these folks. Um, so you're probably seeing from each other other ideas, too, you know, about what what folks might um how, how they make these decisions about rule outs. And again, there, there isn't sort of a one, one standard that you can follow, but wanting to get you thinking about what would feel right and comfortable for you. Can I say something? Yeah, about that? please. I think you'd want to, uh, since this is kind of an ethical guideline, you'd probably want to put in your notes that mm -hmm. you considered that, mm -hmm. um, that you consider the appropriateness of uh, video therapy for this uh, patient. And then you, that you found that, um, you believe that this person is would be appropriate, um, and just you documenting that would kind of ful fulfill a certain requirement. If you don't document it, it kind of like it didn't exist. Um, so I would suggest not only thinking about it, mm -hmm. but documenting that you thought about it. Yeah, great. So I did see a comment in the question box that some folks are not seeing other people's comments, and we'd love for you to be able to do that. Um, Take a look, are you entering your comments into the chat box and then choose the option that allows you to share it with all, all attendees, I believe is how it's framed. And that, that would help folks to see your comments if you wanna share them beyond just with the, with the uh, presenters here. Um, okay, great. So uh, tip number five actually includes quite a few points because the folks who, um, submitted questions in advance, had lots of questions about laws and HIPAA and practicing across state lines. And so I want to preface this with acknowledging I'm going to hit on five topics here and really just provide kind of an overview of each of these with the idea that I can refer you to more information or you can learn more. So these are the five points that we'll kind of briefly touch on. And again, each of these topics are complex and could use a whole hour, you know, just to itself. So we'll, we'll do our best to give you a little overview today to get you started. Um, so let's first talk about HIPAA compliant systems. So um, before I, I go to the next slide, let's do a thought question. How, how many of you are using Skype or FaceTime with your patients, right? And you don't even have to disclose, just answer for yourself because what you're gonna see on this next slide is that, um, I say as of my last check, and I say that purposely with a little disclaimer because the technology changes so fast, but as of my last check, your standard uh, access to Skype and, and FaceTime are not considered HIPAA compliant. And so really, we should not be using these for any patient-related work we do. Um, now, you know, HIP, meeting HIPAA compliance is a complex um bag of uh, requirements, right? And, you know, you have to have a business associates agreement, it has to be encrypted, all these different levels. So up top of this slide here, you see a handful of examples of programs that claim to be HIPAA compliant and will sign what's called a BAA or a business associates agreement with you. Um, and so they're ones that many therapists who are doing video-based therapy are, are, are using. 
Um, now your clients will ask you to do Skype or FaceTime because it feels easiest for them, right? Mostly because it's familiar and, and it is important that your client feels comfortable with the technology. So again, this requires you to plan in advance, pick a system that's HIPAA compliant and then help your clients understand why those are necessary and why you would not want to put them at risk by using these other systems. Um, so always double check because as I mentioned with how quickly technology changes, you know, I can't guarantee by the time you watch this recorded that something won't be different. Um, but many of the systems listed there are quite user friendly and easy to use and actually fairly affordable. So it doesn't need to be a barrier. You don't need to be um, held back by the technology. Um, so here's our second poll. And this is related to practicing across state lines. So for those of you who are coming in today from out of the US, um, this question may not feel as, as interesting or relevant for you because uh, international laws do differ. Um, but the question says, so if you, are if you are a US practitioner and you're licensed by the state of California, and really you can replace California with any other state you want, and a client from New York requests video therapy because you have specialization in treating his type of problem, can you provide him services? So go ahead and we'll launch the poll now and I want you to answer questions, um, you know, option one, two, three, or four. Yes, because I have this specialization. Uh, two, because I have practice and expertise in doing video therapy. Three, no, it would be breaking New York law or no, for item four, it would be breaking California law. And we're seeing lots of variety of answers come in, which is always fun. Okay, you see our eyes honing in as we see this. We see about 60% of people uh -huh. answered, yeah. We, we should have put a, I don't an, want to answer because I really don't know, because my guess is a lot of non-responders will be saying, I'm, I'm not sure, right? Because this is such yeah. a confusing question for folks and probably the most commonly asked question among clinicians on listservs and mm -hmm. discussion groups all the time. Um, and the answer is complicated, as, as we'll talk about in just a moment. So I'll just give five more seconds and we'll move on, realizing that many folks may not may not feel confident answering. Yeah, maybe those who don't feel comfortable answering mm -hmm. and try to guess. still guess something. That's a great point. Because being wrong will teach you. Yeah. Make sure you learn. Yeah. There's no consequences for wrong answers here. Anonymous. <laughs> Okay, let's let's do move on because I want to be attentive to making sure we get. So I'm closing the poll. Yeah. And I'm going to show the results. Great. Okay, so um, by far the most folks said that um, their their belief is they'd be breaking California law by practicing. So again, this is a clinician who's licensed in California and practicing with a client who's located in New York. So most folks thought they were breaking California law. Um, the second most popular was the idea that actually you're breaking a New York law. And then we have just a few people coming in on those ideas that it's more about specialization in either an area of need or in video therapy. Let me close that out and I'll go to the next slide. So the, the, the most correct answer here actually is that we'd be breaking breaking New York law, okay? And this, again, confuses a lot of people. Um, and it um, the, the rationale here is that when we are licensed by a state, we're licensed to practice with, with clients in that state. So as a California provider, I'm only licensed to work with folks in the state of California. Now, California law actually doesn't explicitly state that I can't practice out of state. But what New York law says is that no one without a New York license can practice in New York, right? So we're, we're actually in trouble by the state where the client is because it looks as if we're practicing in their state without a, a license. So it'd be as if, you know, you got your degree in one place, you moved to a new state and just opened up a shop and started practicing, but you don't have a license in that new state. And that's how conservative interpretation of law is, is dictating telehealth, okay? Now, there are, um, you know, the laws are changing rapidly. There's definitely organizations right now that are fighting for interstate 
um, licensing laws that would open this up to broader practice, which, you know, if you are someone who wants to be involved in advocacy and you want telehealth to expand, it's a great thing to get involved with. In the meantime, I do encourage you to consult with experts and inquire with the state that you're interested in doing telehealth, right? There is this website down here at the bottom um, that's also listed in our uh, additional resources at the end of the handouts that actually discusses state policies and punishments for practicing in each state without a license. So if you need, if you're someone who's motivated by a little information and maybe a little fear, you might take a look at what does New York say they would do with someone who was practicing there without a license. Now let's let's expand on this for just another minute and think about, so why do so many clinicians take this risk? Because if you're like me, you could rattle off a whole bunch of people you know who are doing this anyway, right? It's actually very common that folks are practicing across state lines and even internationally. So it's maybe, and this is this is a theory from, from reading I've done, is that um, it's possible that folks are taking the risk because it's very rare that states actually pursue legal action against clinicians who are crossing state lines, okay? What is more likely to happen actually is if you were to go to court for some other problem, let's say there was some other accusation of malpractice, right? That then upon being brought into a court process, it would be added acknowledgement that you were actually practicing in the state without a license. So I think many clinicians tell themselves, well, I'm not gonna get in trouble for anything else because I'm so careful and ethical and legal um, that they feel pretty comfortable doing this. now. Um, and internationally, it's also a lot of folks take the risk because many international, many countries outside of the U.S. have less stringent licensing laws to begin with and may not have um, any any laws indicating whether it's okay or not to practice within that country without a license. So what you need to do is do your due diligence. You know, if you want to practice in another state or country, you need to find out what's allowed in that state or country and um, document. And then, of course, consult with your um, liability coverage, right? Because you'd want to explicitly say to them, if I was practicing in this other state and there was a problem, would you cover me? You want to explicitly have that in writing to find out if they might drop you because they could argue that you had, you know, uh, broken the law. Okay. Um, just one word about this and you can read the details later. A lot of folks will then ask, well, what about short term? So what if my client is just traveling to another state on business or vacation and I need to do short term work? And the conservative interpretation, again, is that you really should not do that because you're crossing state lines. Um, if you're going to do it, you would want to very clearly document in your session note why you made that choice. For example, if the risk of not seeing the person is higher than the risk of seeing the person, then you might document you know, how you came to that conclusion. And you can also consider getting short-term approval to practice in the location where the, the client will be. So for example, I one time did a round of intensive therapy with a client from the state of New York who came to California and worked with me for a few days. And when he went home, I got approval from the state of California to continue seeing him. They authorized up to, I think it was 15 or 20 sessions that I could work with him on telehealth because I, I wrote a letter arguing why he needed this follow-up care and why he couldn't get the exact same type of treatment in state um, at that point. So, so given- I'm sorry, Angela, you said the state of California was your approval? I'm sorry. Wow, thank you for the catch there. No, of course I needed, right? thank you. Of course I needed approval from the state of New York, right? That's who I was appealing to or applying to. Because that client flew back yes, to New York where they were. Right, lived. right, right. So I wasn't breaking New York law because I had this documentation saying I could practice short term. So that's something you could pursue. And of course, you can also consider getting licensed in the state where you might wanna see folks. For example, Amy Hoyle, one of our clinicians is licensed in both Ohio and Kentucky, kind of border states there. She can see people face to face in both states as well as do telehealth then in two states. Um, so it's another option to consider. Um, so I know that was dense and a lot of information and I we're gonna move on and know that you have these additional resources in the handouts to learn more about those, those parts, okay. Um, just briefly, other folks asked about, do you have to code? Do you have to use different 
billing codes when you do telehealth? And the simple answer is yes. Um, it is your responsibility to code accurately. And so especially if you're doing Medicare or Medicaid, you want to actually get the information directly from them about how they want you to code telehealth. But in short, it is considered insurance fraud. If you just list 90834 as your 50 minute session, that implies it was a face to face session. And insurance may or may not have a different coverage for telehealth. Um, most often now folks are asking us to use these what's called a GT code that indicates it's telehealth. Um, I always say, heck, when in doubt, just add an asterisk or a parenthesis that says video therapy, right? It would be absolutely clear so that it's never, no one can ever say you were trying to mislead the insurance or Medicare. Um, there's also a resource in your handouts about learning more about coding. Um, and then lastly, let's see, in brief here, oh gosh, I have two more in this section more. I'm a, I'm taking way too much time, aren't I? We'll, we'll, we'll power through them. Um, regarding informed consent for video therapy, um, there's, you know, folks ask, what do you have to inform your clients up front, right? What is important for them to know? And um, the, the basics is that your, your informed consent documents should add a statement that talks about the risks and benefits of telehealth, right? So many folks in their um, informed consent documents will include risks and benefits of counseling in general. Um, you would want to add the risks and benefits of telehealth. And there's so many good research studies that talk about the, the beautiful parts of telehealth that you can cite. And then, of course, you can refer to sites that show, you know, potential um, limits of it, right? Um, you also would want to discuss this and document that in your note that you discussed it and made a decision together with the client that video therapy would be helpful for them. Um, and of course, you can do this in your intake paperwork so that you don't have to just rely on the verbal conversation. Um, and the last thing that I'll add around kind of this legal ethical part here is that every licensing board, so whether you're a social worker, a medical doctor, a psychologist, etc., has their own ethical statement regarding telehealth. And here I've provided the website. I would add to your to-do list this week that if you have not yet read the ethical statement of your licensing board, that's a great place to start, right? And an important, important part to do. Um, so, uh, so we'll move on to, to one final tip before I hand, hand things off to Moor for a bit, and that's related to making a plan for contact between sessions. Um, you want to be thoughtful about how often will you talk with patients, and will that be different than what you do with your face-to-face -face clients? A list some examples here of things to, to think about, right? And we'll have you do that, kind of add that to your to-do list as well. And as with anything, decide your policy in advance, discuss it with the client, document it, and then just be consistent is what I recommend. Um, so, more why don't you take on with tip number seven? Thank you, Angela. And... Um... It really uh, is striking how um, kind of challenging this. I, I noticed mm. that your poll question was was really difficult yeah. to answer, and I, I think I want to say also those who answered um, that uh, the California clinician uh, cannot practice with a New York person because of um, um, of Cal breaking California law. Um, I don't know that it's completely wrong because there is this kind of question of scope of practice sure. that could be argued. Um, and um, we could leave that uh, go. But um, I wanted to also just talk for a minute about logistics. Um, first, you've noticed that we've been talking about video therapy and telehealth. In my mind, telehealth feels like a mouthful and feels a little more technical. That's why we chose to call it video therapy. But sometimes officially it is called telehealth um, mm -hmm. in other places. So we, we're going to we use these terms interchangeably. Usually with my patients, I call it video therapy. Um, and then I wanted to say something also not related, uh, but maybe important to some of you. Um, you have the handouts um, to this uh, presentation. So because a lot of what Angela said, I think you might want to go back and review mm -hmm. and uh, you if you want to use those handouts, you're welcome to it but they're only gonna be available to you during the time of the presentation to download. Mm -hmm. So um, for those of us, those of you who are, who are attending this live, now between now and the end of this uh, session is your opportunity to uh, download the, the handouts if you want them. They're all available to you in PDF form. The orange P. The orange P. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So um, next, we're going to this kind of section. We're kind of wrapping up with connection and warmth. And we're also wrap, we've wrapped up with that. We're wrapping up now with the legal and ethical parts of our tip uh, session today. And we want to talk to you about how to make it more effective. And remember, I gave kind of a clue that the idea is that um, technology is not only limiting in video therapy is like warmth and connection. It's actually can be used as enhancing. And this has been really exciting for me as a video therapy clinician, as I'm developing in this field, um, it's been really exciting for me to, to kind of realize that, that there's, it's like a, a whole new uh, kind of ball game where we have different things under our disposal that we previously wouldn't. And I, you wouldn't think, think much of it before actually starting to practice on, on video. So I want you to think about how can you use technology to improve the effectiveness of therapy. Uh, it's not only something that is a barrier to connection, it's actually could be something conducive to effective therapy. So um, here's some tips about that. I want you to, once you start thinking about it, you, you, you'll think about it yourself and figure out what works for you. But I want to encourage you, if you feel comfortable, there's the HIPAA question and, you know, uh, all that stuff. But think, is there a shared document that you can have uh, on, on Google Docs or something like that, that you can share uh, with your patient? Maybe your patient can kind of create, write their homework on it and give it to you at a certain time so you can see. And that, that serves as an accountability and kind of a, a shared, shared document that otherwise you wouldn't have as easy access to. You can share your screen. Sometimes I, I often share my screen with my patients when I show them uh, we have a, a symptom measurement tool, uh, uh, like um, um, uh, a uh, uh, measurement of depression and anxiety um, and other, other scales. I can share uh, with my patient how I can see session by session how their symptoms have been doing and um, we can see are we making progress here are, we, are you stuck somewhere and is this kind of scale appropriate and, and um, does it uh, seem to be kind of saying something that's true about what's going on for them so kind of using it as an enhancement of their own awareness to how therapy is going how they themselves are doing um, have them share their own screen with certain things um, one time, I just give it as an anecdote, I had a, a session with a patient who, um, we were in Silicon Valley, he was in San Francisco, and he was struggling with social anxiety. So um, we decided to do the smile and say hello technique, um, and I encouraged him, why don't you do it now? So he, he left the desktop, the, the, the desktop that he was connecting with me from, we went on the iPhone, and mm -hmm. that, that's one situation that I would encourage it. He was with earbuds in his iPhone, and I was right there, He's in the streets of San Francisco. I'm in Silicon Valley, you know, 50 miles away. And um, he's walking down the street and he's kind of showing me what's going on around him. And I could say to him, why don't you go and smile and say hello to this person? And he went to smile and he smiled and said hello. And then I said, how about you now say, how are you? Smile and say, how are you? Because that kind of encouraged the other person to actually answer back, which was even more intimidating. So this lovely young man was super bright and wonderful, was struggling with social anxiety, and I was able to really be there in a much easier way, kind of get out of the office in a much easier way uh, and, and support him while he's kind of doing alone uh, some exposure work to overcome his anxiety. Um, other options that, that you have that um, I want to encourage you to do, and um, um, Richard, uh, Richard Lamb, who um, is a wonderful therapist here in, in California, and um, he's, um, he, he does a lot of video therapy with our California folks on a video therapy program, um, suggested using the, just simply the chat box. Um, they can, um, you can use the chat box if you're doing uh, different things to um, actually just type in exactly what they're saying, and then they can kind of look at it and, and face it. Sometimes we do all sorts of practice of communication skills with our patients, and you can type exactly what they say, and then they can read it and say, oh, here's where it worked, here's where it didn't work. Creates a nice, a nice uh, addition to, to the therapy. Um, Taylor Chesney reminded me, reminded us that um, there is the option to record. Taylor is, uh, is our, our, a New York clinician. She heads our New York office and also does video therapy there. And um, she 
if she was saying, look, if you feel comfortable with it, if you have the patient kind of signs the consent for it, um, you can record the sessions and use them and then they can um, review them later. So uh, these are things for you to decide. You're the licensed clinician. You can decide, do you feel comfortable with patient recording session or not, um, et cetera. So um, make uh, use of technology. Mm -hmm. um, another way to making it effective is something Angela is going to talk yeah. about. Right? Yeah. So we'll talk briefly about safety planning. I know we're coming to the end of our hour here. So um, in sum, with safety planning, the key is to collect lots of information up front, right? And you can take the pressure off yourself by doing this in your paperwork. Remember that, you know, really a safety plan in telehealth requires you to be a hundred percent confident that you could access help for this person if there was an emergency, meaning if they were actively suicidal, if they had a heart attack as they sat on screen with you. And of course, these are very rare things, but that's what you need to be prepared for and hope you'll never have to use them. So simple things you see in the middle of your screen that you can add to your intake paperwork include asking the patient to do the research. What is the local hospital or emergency room? Who is a local emergency contact, someone that is nearby that could help? Um, who are their local medical or mental health providers, right? It'd be wonderful to have a team feel of having someone, even if it's a primary care doctor on the ground in the local town, right? And those you could collect up front, and that way if there is an emergency, you're one step closer. Um, also keep in mind that dialing 911 internationally is not going to be effective. Um, dialing 911 for someone in another state can be effective, but takes longer. They'll essentially research for you how to access the local providers. And so if you really felt someone was high risk and you we're already doing video therapy, you might want to work ahead to come up with what's the local um, police phone number that you could call directly. Okay, more. Um, oh, this is mine too, isn't it? I'm sorry. I think so, yeah. <laughs> you know, I we actually really it. already addressed this. Moore talked quite a bit at the beginning about the importance of having your clients be in a position where they could take notes, that it really solidifies having them be present, be focused, taking the session really seriously. So let's let's move on to your point number 10 then. Okay. So uh, one uh, final tip here is thinking about um, – ways how can you kind of dive in in the start of a session i think making a therapy session more effective has a lot of times to do in my experience and i'm sure you can share that uh, share that experience too is that uh, there's kind of time that lapses between the time that session starts and the time that meaningful emotional connection and um uh, work is being done. And I want to think with you, and this is a tip that that's the, the way I use, I want to share my system with you so you can think if there's something of it that you'd want to take for yourselves that helps shorten that time. I don't want a 50 minute session to be wasted 10% of that, or I'm sorry, 10 minutes or 20% of that 50 minute session to be wasted on like a uh, patient sharing with me what happened to him during the last week and, and, and things like that, that sometimes can be valuable, but sometimes can feel like just a warm up. And I want that warm-up to be, if possible, shorter. And I think there are ways. And this is one, one tip for it, to dive right inside of the session. So I just wanted to share my system with you. What I do is I, want, I, I, think, about, I think about two things. I want to first make sure that I get the chance to connect with my patient quickly about how they are feeling. I want to hear how they're feeling. I want to give them a chance to tell me specifically how they're feeling, not what they're thinking so much, not what's going on for them, but really how they are feeling, kind of connect with some feeling words. And then I want to also bear in mind kind of that, that I don't know, it's kind of a lame two punch kind of uh, idea, but the first punch is getting kind of into the emotions and the second is um, insisting on reviewing uh, homework because we know that homework, doing homework, doing things between sessions is so important, at least to me, for making therapy effective and i don't want to get the session to um take too long about talking about other stuff that could be important and and as a result of it kind of missing out on really keeping the patient accountable patient seeing that i'm taking their homework very seriously mm -hmm. and that would encourage them to do work so first connect with emotion second I want to review the homework. And so what I do is I, I use technology for that. I'm giving you here an example of our system for um, mood sur survey. So we start the session with reviewing how a patient is feeling and I can you now come very quickly and say, hey, Jack, um, whoops. Uh, say, hey, Jack, I noticed that you're feeling um, uh, kind of 
somewhat uh, down today. I see that you're feeling kind of fairly down in the dumps and uh, you're feeling uh, kind of your low self-esteem is more is more pronounced and not very motivated. Is that true? Does that kind of depict how you're feeling right now? And then I'm going to stop and I listen for a minute or two. And then I say, um, so now um, after I feel there's connection. Let's share this Google Doc and see, tell me about your... Um, your homework. Let's let's review your homework. And here's an example of a homework that um, I actually gave to someone um, not so long ago about how uh, you need to write an essay about how hopelessness becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then he was also, um, like the other example, doing some smile and saying hello technique and he was recording it. So we can review it using the, uh, the Google Doc that's right there. Um, and um, I find it uh, that it cuts down tremendously on this kind of wasted uh, time in the beginning of session. So hope you can take something out of it uh, for you to use in your practice. Um, so this is yeah, you, Angela, right? Awesome. Yeah. So here's the slide where I list a number of websites. Again, hopefully you've clicked on the orange P button to download these handouts so you can refer to these later. These are opportunities for more learning that we hope are helpful to you. Um, wanted to let you know our contact information, of course, Maura and I would love to just be in touch and connect with you all in the future and, and you know, be, be support in whatever version may be helpful. And of course, we want you to know how to find these clinicians we've mentioned who are these excellent CBT, or specifically Team CBT, the Burns model of CBT clinicians who are spread throughout Canada and the US. As you see, um, you can have a potential client schedule a free 15 minute video conversation with one of them um, by going to our website, which is videotherapy.live. You'd click on the appropriate state or country and um, it would help you schedule the, the free 15 minute consultation. So we hope that's easy if you were wondering how to access those people. Um, the other thing we want to make you aware of is that again, this recording will be sent out within a few days along with a CE survey if you attended the whole presentation live today might take a few days to get that. Once you do the survey, which is required, you'd receive the certificate. And also want you to know that the recording will be available on our YouTube channel, um, which is, um, uh, how do they find our YouTube channel? Just feeling good. Go to YouTube. YouTube. Feeling yeah, good super Institute. easy to find, right? Yeah. Um, and there's other wonderful resources there as well for you if you're interested in, in uh, seeing other educational videos. So we hope this was valuable for you today. It was fun for us to connect with folks in this way and we hope to have connection again in the future. Want to say anything else? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you again for, for making this happen yeah. with us and asking questions that made this webinar uh, possible. Yeah, and best wishes if you decide to launch into video therapy yourself. Totally. Okay, bye.